Hey boys and girls, it's your buddy Drew from Living History Mysteries. You know, so often I receive comments and messages and emails from people wanting to see specific things. And here recently, I received an email from a married gentleman out of Illinois. Close by where we're at right now. This is Cave in Rock, right on the Ohio River in South Central Illinois. Back in the 18th century, this place right here played an intricate part in the river piracy of this entire region. And one couple in particular suspected brothers, possibly cousins, held up in this place with a group of river pirates but proved themselves to be so bloodthirsty, so treacherous, that they were even too much for the pirates to handle and they were asked to leave. Stick with us today as we take a look at a legend coming out of northeastern Tennessee and reaching clear to the Mississippi River, down into Mississippi, Georgia, the Carolinas, the American Revolution. Today, we're gonna talk about the Hart Brothers, America's first serial killers right here on Living History's Mysteries. Stay tuned. In regard to the marvelous landscapes of southeastern America, its reputation is not easy to deface. With so much beauty in nature, with its temperate and bountiful country, one may overlook the clouded waters to avoid the dark history of their land. One of these more infamous subjects in this history would be the Hart brothers, residing in southern Appalachian mountains, who led a band of brigands during late 18th century in pursuit of amusement, indulgence, and thrill in all the wrong ways. Arps were crafty murderers. They weren't the kind to waste gunpowder either, often using tomahawks, killing people as young as 11 merely for a pair of boots. These Eastern American marauders have been documented as the first serial killers and may have killed up to 50 people. With canoes, flatboat, and rafts, there were ordinary hapless travelers and men used to carry cargo across the rivers of eastern U.S. Riverboat trade flourished on the Cumberland River as it branches from Ohio River to Mississippi River. Many villages, towns, and cities sprang up as a result of its rising commerce. Along with this surge of business came with freebooters, and this trading showed itself an opportunity to Big Harp, Little Harp, and their women intercepting many traders and peddlers on the water as they navigated the channels where the streams graduated into rocky rapids where rafts are slowed and forces their oarsmen to tend to the matter, restricting paddling. If you by chance were traveling by water and came upon one of these shallow sections, you will be made vulnerable, especially if your flat boat is manned by a family, and you bear not only valuable goods, but also your personal belongings. You are an easy victim and run risk being overtaken by Indians or bandits. The river routes were lawless and wild. This portion of the southeastern American region belonged to the Spanish colonies at the time, and their military wasn't exactly concentrated in this part of the world. The outlaws were definitely winning during this period, and the decent, considerate people did very little to do anything to stop it. In fact, 
there were more people involved in providing a market for stolen property or enabling the highwaymen and robbers to travel by getting in good with the ferry operators and other earliest pioneer authorities during the time, allowing expansion for the criminals. The permissiveness of this situation basically invited pillage, rape, and other awful acts against the people living in the wild frontier of western Kentucky, Tennessee, southern Illinois, northern Mississippi, and other surrounding areas, especially where the rivers ran. They may not have been actual blood brothers. It's said they may have just been cousins, but they certainly did share a blood lust. The infamous brothers engaged in strange slayings, their moniker being a repeated account of mangling through their victims' internal organs and stuffing their intro with stones to sink the corpses into the river. The depravity of these early acts of evidence concealment could prove that the final tally of their body count could be incorrect. Their immigrant patriarchs John and William Harper came from Scotland in approximately 1759, bringing up the Hart Boys in the 1770s in Orange County, North Carolina. Like the infamous brothers, there's confusion surrounding their exact roles in the family too. Whether they both raised the Makaija and Wiley, or if one outdid the other in raising the monsters, is forgotten and unknown. It's commonly believed that the William and John were indeed brothers, and they each had a boy of their own. This would make the Hart boys cousins. At the outbreak of the American Revolution, little is known of the Harps' whereabouts. According to an eyewitness account of Captain James Wood, they joined the Tory rape gang in North Carolina and took part in the kidnapping of three teenage girls with the fourth being rescued by Captain Wood. These gangs took advantage of the war by raping, stealing, murdering, and burning and destroying property, especially farms, of Patriot colonists. The North Carolina residents John and William Harp sided with loyalists against the colonists, which led to their property being seized as a result of the Redcoats being defeated in 1780. The young Hart brothers were left to defend themselves, since it's not known what really happened to their two father figures. Some accounts say the Harps viewed from afar as their dads were tortured and hanged for their loyalist connections. This early imagery of depravity and butchery that the Harps were exposed to separated them from the elect and decided residents of the Eastern Appalachian area they were present in. According to historian John Musgrave, they probably decided if they were going to hell, they might as well make a grand entrance. After they ran away out of their homes, they moved west of Appalachian Mountains. They lived a survival above all else lifestyle, which could explain why they kill so insipidly detached from lovingness and kindness. Holed up in caves, living off whatever they could hunt or find, this way of living is almost comparative to a predator like a panther in the forest. Given their scotch-soaked past, the young harps were very pro-monarchy as well. They lived around 12 years among the Cherokee, and it's speculated when Chief John Watts leader of renegade faction known as Chickamauga, led his attack on 1792 on the settlement of Buchanan Station, a battle that would determine Nashville's future. The Harps were there on his side, and when Major James Orr sprang his counterattack in 1794, it wiped out the Chickamauga town of Nickajack near Chattanooga, killing numerous women and children. The Harps are said to have slipped away the night before. Walking along the wilderness trail while the harps were tracking would have not been safe. 
if you were taking a stroll and were to do just that, then you would have seen a burly, long-limbed man wielding a tomahawk, Makaija Big Harp. He has a definite Scottish draw in his accent. His skin with the reddish-pink undertones probably accentuated with blistering sun exposure. Walking near Big Harp would be the devious, smaller, and shorter gingerly fellow with webbed toes that is wily little harp. It's said that like many of the settlers of North Carolina, they may have been slightly melungeon, rumored to have some black ancestry, which you wouldn't be able to tell by their appearance. Walking behind them on the trail would probably be two or three bedraggled women, being called the Harp's wives. Either one may be kidnapped women, but there's an account that Makaija married Susan Roberts and unofficially wed her sister Betsy as a supplementary wife. Wily Little Harp had a woman of his own. She was the daughter of a renowned preacher, John Rice, and her name was Sally Rice. She joined the brigands in Knoxville during 1797 and legally married Little Harp. They all settled into life at a cabin along the Beaver Creek near Holston River, eight miles outside Knoxville, Tennessee. The Harps brothers used their so-called wives for many of their schemes, having the women let children suckle on their bosom to evoke pity to travelers, just to bushwhack the indisposed victims as they lured them in. The two were also known to have an unspecified number of slaves with them sometimes as well. Their first murder was Moses Doss, a man who may have tried to flirt or get with one of the Harp's women. They killed him after he was showing affection toward one of Big Harp's wives. It's also said the prey was defiled and covered in urine. Then, in 1798, near Knoxville, Tennessee, where the Harp's bandits disemboweled their second victim, doing their signature adding rocks into victim's torso, and when dumping a fellow named Johnson, they met and drank with him at a tavern in the Holston River. This is the first documented account, as far as I know, that involves the ghastly disposing of bodies, which exhibits their astute frontier resourcefulness that allowed them to be perfect fit for the harshness of the Appalachian Mountains and surrounding wilderness. The way we may know this, evidently, is because some of the rocks and the corpses' innards became dislodged, bobbing the cadavers to the surface. The author of The Outlaw Years, Robert M. Coates, once wrote, It was from the Indians they learned to strike with cunning and walk warily. The brothers killed men, women, and children indiscriminately for barely any money or no reason at all. The Harp brothers stole livestock such as hogs and horses incessantly as a livelihood because they supplied John Miller, a butcher merchant, with meat. Of course, their supplies were all stolen, soon getting into higher stakes thefts such as horse theft, which is as wicked a crime as murder in these days, leading a farmer named Teal to form a group of regulators to capture the Harp brothers. Once their suspicions about neighbors contacting the authorities rose up, a series of fires destroyed the barns and outhouses in the area, causing the brothers to steal horses once more to flee out of town due to atrocities they committed. The Harp men left the women behind in a rush. This is the first time their women had the opportunity to abandon them. Yet, instead, they tracked through miles of wilderness just to join them in a predetermined hideout. The Harps were captured by Teal and his regulators, but managed to escape, and before leaving Knoxville, they made sure to kidnap a man named Johnson, who was reportedly a snitch foreign informant to Teal and others, purportedly saying like a canary about the brigand brothers' atrocities and where their horses may be at. They found Johnson before leaving Tennessee when they came to the rowdy groggery, 
operated by a man named Hughes west of Knoxville. They did their classic river dumping method, leading to Johnson's corpse being found ripped open, filled with stones in the Holstead River, a trademark of many harp victims. After they fled to Kentucky by the Wilderness Road, they killed a peddler named Peyton, then killed two travelers from Maryland named Bates and Paca. The two were on the way to being friends with the harps, only to end up slaughtered. This kind of senseless betrayal wasn't uncommon for these outlaw partners. Soon after, a man called Stephen Thomas Langford invited the harps to dinner during their journey through Cumberland Gap into Kentucky. Langford, who tried to befriend them out of brotherly compassion, was killed, and his money was taken as well as his horse. Local cattle drivers discovered his body in a forest when their cattle were upset by the spell of the rotting Langford. A local innkeeper pointed the authorities to the harps. Captain Joseph Ballinger, a hardened Native American fighter, gathered a crew of regulators and caught up with the brothers and their female supporters. Oddly, the brothers seemed submissive and yielded without coercion. They and the women were eventually jailed in Danville, Kentucky to await their trials. All five were to be tried for Stephen Langford's murder. They managed to escape, but don't forget, snitches get stitches when it comes to the harps. When a posse was sent after the harps, the regulators bolted in fear when it was discovered that a man who aided the authorities had his son killed, and he was mutilated in retribution by the harps. Just to get mutilated after experiencing the overcome, doomed fate that was the loss of his dear son, the harps took the boy's flower bag and crept into the backwoods. Another murder was one of Farmer Bradbury, and then a young boy that was hunting cows in the wood near Mammoth Cave, where they knocked his head against a tree to death. Back in Danville, the three women remained and were put into trial. The unattractive Susan was found guilty, but her sister Betsy and Wiley's wife Sally Harp were set free. Since it was unfair to keep Susan, but let the other two women free, she was acquitted and reconsidered overturned. They asserted that they'll not go join the Barbarous Brothers again, yet they go anyways, which was a wearisome, arduous journey as the women each had given birth to infants during their stay in Danville. On April 22nd, the governor of Kentucky issued a $300 reward for the capture of the harps. During this time, the degree of crime in the western part of Kentucky, particularly in the Ohio River County, from the Green River on down, urged the local militias into action. The Ohio River is the main trade route for America during these times. This was mainly uncharted until 1835 and was inhabited by the Shawnee. The Harps Rendezvous was set at Cave in Rock, Illinois, a renowned spot for river pirates, most well-known resident being Samuel Mason. With no news or outside knowledge, travelers would unknowingly come upon this cave by water travel during their drifting flatboat commutes. These boats carry families, merchants, and other settlers toward western territories, including their clothing, tools, livestock, and other barter-worthy goods that could be sold downriver, especially in New Orleans. This kind of trader behavior was so common that if you see a camp on the side of the stream, if you were so inclined to barter, you would approach. This is where the cutthroat robbers such as the Harps, Mason, and their parties would lure in travelers, take their boat and cargo, then sell it downriver themselves. This delicate coalition was broken once the Harps acquired a male prisoner from the flatboat raids, stripped him down nude, and put him on a horse, then shattered, beat, and drove the blindfolded animal over the edge of the cliff to shock Mason and his cronies 
as they unwarily were congregated at the base of the cliff. The petrified horse and screaming captive crashed down on the rock just outside Caven Rock. This outrageous mischief was met with disapproval, causing Mason to banish the harps and their women. Some say the only reason Mason's crew didn't kill the harps was out of pity for the women and children, exemplifying how even the most brutish outlaws weren't as cruel as the harps. Too vile and wicked to even dwell with veteran cutthroats, they head back to Knoxville. Back to Tennessee. The harps soon hunt for Hugh Dunlap, and upon finding Dunlap's homestead, the brothers blundered and killed William Ballard by mistake in the darkness outside. Ballard was disemboweled like some of the other poor victims, fleeing again continuing on. Their ramble was rougher now than before. Now that they're dealing with crying children day-to-day -day life, Makaija was not the paternal type. This is where he notoriously slung his own daughter's head against a tree to end the weeping. Also, they killed an unnamed girl and cut her into one-inch strips according to Ernest Hart. Then they seized another pair of brothers James and Robert Brassel, irrationally hooting that they have finally caught the dreaded Hart brothers. Pretending to be bounty hunters as a sort of sick game, it's needless to say that they have reached peak insanity. When one of the brothers, Robert, escaped, he came back with a group that he found on the trail to assist them, freeing his captive brother, just to witness his brother's James head divided by a tomahawk when he returned. A few miles down the path, the men did indeed find the harps, but only armed with one rifle. They didn't confront them out of horror. They continued tracking toward Tennessee, and it's conveyed by some articles that the harps were on the way to Big Harp's wives, Susan and Betsy's father, old Mr. Roberts, when they were traveling through the Red Banks area near Henderson, Kentucky and their journey cut short when they stopped and settled for a while south of Green River at Canoe Creek. After passing through Henderson County, which was a neighborly small knit community that had just rid itself of some rascals, they were unsuspecting of the harps. A man named John Slover who lived about a mile away killed a bear and was returning home when he heard the clicking failure to fire of a rifle behind him. He looked and saw his two new neighbors and spurred his horse escaping, then reported the incident to General Samuel Hopkins, who was living at Red Banks. That same month, a man named Trowbridge was found disemboweled in Highland Creek. The Harps evidently stole Trowbridge's salt that he retrieved from Robertson's lick and murdered him outright. They were known about in the area now, and Slover the bear hunter was apprehensive of the harp sending spies and watching the bandit brother. Discreetly, Big and Little Harp disguised themselves as Methodist preachers, and on August 19th, James Tompkins of Henderson County, Kentucky, opens his door to supposed unkempt missionaries under the guise of Makaija. Wiley Hart. He supplied them with the hearty meal, to which the larger of two men says a lengthy grace. They didn't kill Tompkins, but instead filled Tompkins' rifle and a teacup with gunpowder as an act of charity and a thanking for the meal after Tompkins ironically expressed how he was out of gunpowder and didn't have any wild game. Later on, this would certainly be a mistake. Their eyes became set on another goal shortly thereafter and it's believed they were on their way to take out Silas Magnum, a.k.a. Mick B, after hearing about how he punishes criminals. They veered away from Mick B's homestead because they're vicious guard dogs, rerouting back to Knoxville, and they came upon Moses Steagle's cabin. Moses Steagle may have been in cohorts with the Harps in a sense, allowing them shelter for several nights at his cabin. Untimely, Steagle's wife had arranged for a surveyor named Major Love, to be allowed to spend the night at the cabin. While we don't know the actual event's chronology and cause of detonation, as rumor has it, the Harps axed Major Love to death 
that killed Stiegel's infant son by slicing his throat with the blade just after expressing to Moses' wife Mary that he would just help quiet her son as he cried while she cooked breakfast for them. They finally impaled Mary Stiegel as she returned to find her crib turned crimson. It must have startled Big Harp when Mary shrieked, stabbing her so hard that the dagger was launched deep so deep that the flames of the cabin didn't even scorch the handle of the knife. This event may have been a deliberate decoy to lure in Silas McBee Magby as they eventually hid beside the road hoping that McBee would see the fire, investigate, and fall into their trap. Instead, two men, Hudgens and Gilmore, came along and the Harps accused them of murdering the Steagles. The Harps told the men that they would have to appear before McBee. When the men, thinking they had nothing to fear from McBee, started walking in the direction of McBee's house, Big Harp shot Gilmore in the back of the head. Hutchins, upon witnessing this, went running, but was overtaken by Little Harp, who beat his brains out with a firearm. McBee and his Avengers Thankfully for McBee, his route was not synchronized with the brothers' trap as they had hoped. Choosing a different path to the seared cabin, their dissatisfactions with the plan's outcome was bestowed on random travelers, Hutchins and Gilmore, through conversation on the risky road. Enraged by the killing of his family and destruction of his life by the hands of the Harps, he joined Mick B, who raised a posse to avenge the murder of Mrs. Siegel. Joining the party would be John Lyburn, Moses Stiegel, the man who had his family killed, and also the Good Samaritan that fed the Harps brothers when they were disguised as preachers, James Tompkins. They set out in August to go after the murderous brothers and came upon Big Harp and Little Harp, talking to a stranger. The brothers escaped in a different direction and the third man ran toward the regulators and got shot by the group of retaliators. He just then started talking to the Harps and was scared for his life when Mick B's men appeared. Knowing they're getting close to the Harps, they found a small cave and saw Sally Rice Harp alone, apparently abandoned by the others. Sally pointed where the Harps and the two women had fled. Soon, the Roberts women were apprehended and John Liper, a member of Mick B's band, shot Big Harp Makaija in the leg at a cane break, barely wounding him, so he grabs a familiar face's rifle. James Tompkins, which was filled with Makaija's own gunpowder and shoots Big Harp in the spine. But not before Big Harp waved his tomahawk around to keep the pursuers off him as he drove off with his horse again. Gradually getting weaker and less willing to fight, he was lowered by Liper at a cane break again and told the men about the horrors he committed in his life, supplying the men with facts. Liper gave Big Harp his boot filled with creek water because he was expressing thirst to the group of punishers. Stiegel caught up to the men crowded around Makaija eventually and was said to have either decapitated Big Harp alive or shot and removed his head. The beheading was done with Big Harp's own butcher knife. This wasn't before Big Harp's last words were boldly spoken. You're a goddamn rough butcher but cut on and be damned. The vigilantes returned to their area of Robertson's Lick, forcing Susan Roberts, one of the harp wives, to carry her lifeless husband's head as Stiegel placed Makaija's head on a sharpened stick as a warning to other outlaws at a crossroad. The road was therefore known as Harp's Head Road, and it leads to modern Dixon, Kentucky. The women of Harp's brothers were tried for murders at the Stiegel cabin but eventually acquitted once again. Betsy married John Huffstetter and moved to Russellville as tenants of Colonel Anthony Butler. Susan and her daughter took a cabin on the very same plantation, but Susan didn't remarry. Sally Rice Harp remarried to a man named Parson and migrated to Illinois after meeting her future husband in Roan County where she was living with her father John. Wily Little Harp, of course, was still at large and got back with Dread River Pirate Samuel Mason and a man named James May. Little Harp forwent his old identity and called himself James Seton. Mason was developing a nice price bounty, so if James Little Harp may avail himself in betraying Mason with the signature tomahawk for his $2,000 bounty. Why that man's Wily Harp 
said Captain Stump at the courtroom when Wiley was collecting Mason's bounty money. Stump apparently recognized his own horses being used by the infamous river pirate. This wasn't enough proof alone to take down James Seton. However, a man named James Bowman recognized Little Harp and knows he has a scar on his chest from Bowman's knife in the past. This confrontation led to Little Harp exposing his scar forcibly by the local law and was incarcerated. Little Harp and May got away, escaping one last time. They were found hours later in Greenville, Mississippi. After their trial in January 1804, they both met the same fate as Big Harp and their heads mounted as a warning to outlaws on the Natchez Trace. The harp's journey into blood, rage, and death was calculated as some believe. One account of a preacher says that Big Harp saw a signature of George Washington in a minister's Bible, saying to the man of God, That was a brave and good man, but a mighty rebel against the king. This is improbable to be the sole motivation behind their path of terror, but some sort of mania probably manifested itself inside a big harp. Paranoia, psychosis, and a vile twistedness was inherent in the brute's mind. It said that he was convinced the ground was shaking at times, that he was struck with earnest guilt. In their young adulthood and perhaps teenage years, they hoped to find lucrative jobs as slave overseers, yearning for money, adventure, and whipping their own slaves. The men confessed to killing 39 people. This number is likely less than the actual amount, and their heinous transgressions are obviously still marveled about today. One thing is for sure about the misanthropic behavior demonstrated by Big Harp and Little Harp, is that according to J.M. Bazile, an early historian. They killed not for spoil or plunder, but for the gratification of a hellish thirst for carnage, and a fiendish delight in human misery that none could possess but a devil incarnate, carrying within his unnatural and accursed bosom all the rankling and burning furies of the infernal regions. This downfall may have been prevented in the eyes of superstitious claiming that Big Harp once came across the legendary witch's dance scorched grounds along the Natchez Trace. An Indian guide showed him the sacred area and described how the Chickasaw and Choctaw buried their ancestors there in the Indian mounds. So many rumors of witches having ceremonies there were reported, making the area a cursed and avoided place. Unperturbed by the dark legend, Big Harp only scoffed and continued to travel around the blighted grounds. And of course, many legends claim, because of his ignorance, it's believed the witches had taken Big Harp's head off the stake. It was mounted and crushed it into powder and used it as a potion to heal a relative. And soon after, brave wandering souls swear they heard crackling laughter coming from nearby bushes and trees on the traces path during the many gloomy, murky nights to come. Robert M. Coates said it well when he said, Whether the tale is true or not, no one knows. It would have been strangely fitting, certainly, had the head of a madman been pestled and powdered at last to such a crazy purpose. The grounds are still scorched, leaving grassless patches avoided to this day. Rest on the blighted, arid patches that witches danced on and feasted on over 200 years ago, if you dare. Welcome back. Like I said, these guys are suspected of being the first serial killers. Big Harp, well, he confessed over 30 killings. And well, reports from other individuals, missing persons in the areas where they were located at at different times, it could be as high as almost 60. Sadly, almost 300 years later, the world is never going to know. These guys were bloodthirsty, they were dangerous, and they didn't care. They had a bloodlust that even our modern day serial killers just can't compare to. But that's all I've got for you guys today. As always, I'd like to ask you to please subscribe to the channel. It's free. 
don't cost anything to subscribe. Share the videos out, would you please? Like-minded people, friends, family, people that love history and the mysteries it left behind. And don't forget, ring that little bell. That way you'll know when new videos come out. And we've proved time and time again, you never know what we're going to talk about. And oh, by the way, I wanted to let you guys know that when it comes to cave-in rock, I've already suggested to the Midwest Parahistoric Society about possibly doing a summer expedition down here. There is camping on site. The park is open 24 hours a day, which means history, parahistory, and even possibly some metal detecting. This place was an active treasure trove for the river pirates for over 200 years. Who knows what might be left behind. So we're going to see how that goes in the spring, of course. So I'm telling you what, it's chilly out here. Y'all take care.